Hello and welcome to Comic Book Herald's Cree Annotators. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. Today, I'm excited to be joined by the writer of Kill Shakespeare, some Assassin's Creed comics for Titan Comics, Luke Cage, Everyman, Son of Hitler, and a bunch of Insider comics over on Insider.com uh, going on since 2020, the final year of the Trump presidency, and a whole bunch more. It's Anthony Del Cole. Anthony, how are you doing today? I'm fantastic. I'm excited to be on the show, so thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to talk to you. Um, so I, I think I want to start with, um, you know, some of the, the nonfiction stuff you've been going on on insider.com um you know that so i mentioned you know you started covering the final year of the trump presidency and and that's where things began since then topics have included you know a whole bunch of stuff right like prince harry and Meghan markle leaving the royal family the fbi breaking up a, a domestic terrorist conspiracy plot to kidnap michigan's governor um gretchen whitmer and most recently the one that, that really got my attention was uh, how i escaped the chinese internment camp uh, I, I first, I, so I'd read some of your work. I'd read Kill Shakespeare. I'd read Son of Hitler. Um, and then I, I became aware of the nonfiction stuff you're doing. Um, Comic Beat has a, uh, a guide to free web comics. Like it's like one every year. And I saw that and I saw that with um, the, the kidnapping plot. And I was like, this is it really grabbed me by the shoulders. You know, I was like, I knew the broad strokes, but I like none of the details. Um, how did that, how did that gig come together? Like, how did you start doing comics with Insider? Um, it was through Josh Adams, who's done the artwork for all of the comics, except for the internment camp one. Uh, he and I have known each other for years. Uh, he's super talented. We've been trying to find something to work on together. And then, uh, back in, uh, 20, hold on. Wow. I'm, uh, everything's, everything's going past here. Uh, I mean, at the most recent, okay, sorry. Yeah, 2019, uh, October, uh, New York Comic Con, uh, he and I ran into each other and he ended up meeting Walter Hickey, uh, who's the data, technically he's the data editor at uh, Insider, but he's also the, the chief geek, as we like to call yeah. him. Uh, and uh, they had, Insider had done like a comic about, um, oh God, I can't remember what it was. It was, uh, I think it was the Mueller Report. They'd done like a quick little illustrated version of the Mueller, Mueller Report and that had done well. And sure. so they said they wanted to do more of it. So let, like, can we do more comic storytelling to kind of do deep dives? So he he met uh, he met Josh at New York Comic Con 2019. And then Josh and I bumped into each other like the next day. And Josh was like, oh, I might have something interesting I want to work on with you. Uh, and so we went in, we met with um, Walt and uh, Nicholas Carlson, who's the global editor-in-chief, but also a huge, huge comics fan. He probably knows more about comics than I do. Um, and which isn't really saying that much, um, but, uh, no, so, I mean, so they really want to do something. So the first thing they, they decide that they want us to do something about Trump's impeachment, the first impeachment now. Um, and so I, uh, I had to go off. I did a bunch of research because at that point you heard all the stuff like, okay, um, Giuliani was doing all these secret meetings in Ukraine and there was the, the quid pro quo phone call and like all the stuff, like all this background yeah. to Hunter Biden, like what the average person that's reading through it has no idea what it is. Uh, and it's all sort of like talking heads or just people in rooms and, you know, it's, it's tough to get a, a, a firm grasp on it. And so they, they thought sure. by doing illustrated comics or by doing comics, you can illustrate a take on it to kind of demonstrate what exactly it was. So I had to do a, about a month of research to figure out what happened exactly and boiled it down to into like 16 pages. Uh, and so Josh and I uh, put that together. It came out in February, I believe, in 2020. Uh, that did phenomenally well, had hundreds of thousands of readers, um, and then uh, it, it trended on social media, even uh, uh, Anthony Scaramucci, the mooch, uh, Trump's um, <laughs> spokes, uh, spokesperson for all of, what, nine days? Uh, he even, yeah, he even, days. yeah, exactly. He even retweeted it, I believe. Um, and so it kind of caught fire, and they're like, this is gold. Like, let's do some more. And so Prince, we, then we did Prince Harry and Meghan, and then that one had millions of readers. And then from there, we've now done, I think, 10 or 11 comics. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's 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 been a blast. They're great to work with, uh, and I had, as you know, I mean, as you as you outlined there, all the stuff I've done in the comics world has all been fiction, but to be able to do something like this, um, where we're telling real stories, like the for instance, the internment camp. I'm sure you want to talk more about that. I mean, to me, that's probably the most important story I've told thus far, uh, yeah, and yeah. you know, it's the one that I hope the most people read, and we've had great readership on it thus far, and we're doing an amazing motion comic version of it right now. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's the kind of stories that. Uh, it's a great way of making the stories entertaining, uh, but also hopefully we're going to inspire people and enlighten people along the way. Yeah, no, it's interesting. It, it is. It's one of those things where like it is. You're simplifying and you're condensing a lot of complex. And like you said, like with with the impeachment story or whatever, yeah. even as that stuff's coming out, there's like there's a million stories and it's difficult to corral. Like what is actually happening here? You know, like what is the not e not even like what is true so much as just like what is the the meat and the actual like bones of this story um what, what what's been the hardest one for you to sort of like 
condense into a singular narrative? I mean, impeachment, I think, is probably was probably the hardest just because there was so much information. Uh, and I mean, we could have done we could have told there, there was there was a lot that we had to cut actually at the last minute or not the last minute. But in the days leading up to publication, I think we actually did cut two pages that we had fully we had scripted. Josh had done the art for and we're just like, you know what? It just sort of um, it, we do, it's not needed. It's not necessary. It's you know, some of the information is redundant. We actually changed some of the order, some of the pages and changed some of the lettering, too. Um, so, I mean, that was probably the most difficult uh coronavirus as well uh we did uh, one on the tr- um totally under control we called it that came out in i think yeah. april or may of, no may or june of last year and that was all about trump's the trump admin's response to it that was a lot of information um because we had to like f- i did research into the the at the time what was discussed as the roots of the virus um and we had to do comparisons to korea and other places there was a lot there uh, yeah. And then, in, and I, I also want to hallmark or um, um, bookmark internment camp. Like that was tough because there was a lot more of Zumrat's story that could be told. But again, we don't want to. We, you, you need to make it just the right length. I mean, uh, what we do is in traditional comics, it would be like fourteen pages. I mean, I could have told, I could have told a graphic novel because there's so much more that's happening in the Xinjiang region uh, to the Uyghurs. Um, and I mean, that's one of the key things that we want is just to get this across. Cause there's so many people, even my wife, I was telling her when I started working on the project, uh, yes, I'm, I'm Canadian. So I say project, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> but, uh, well, I was telling her about this and she's like, why is no one, wh- why did I not know about this? And why is no one doing anything about it? I'm like, right. oh, it's a, that's a complicated question. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, hopefully with these comics that we're creating, they're expanding people's minds, you know, and. Again, there's we're we're trying to distill it and make it make it fun, make it fun or interesting to read. Right, right. Which is obviously with with these you know sensitive, complicated issues is a challenge. But I think I think you've had some great success here. Um, I definitely the ones that have stood out the most to me are the stories where um, I knew the least about. Right, frankly, and I, I think that's often true of of any nonfiction or history. Is like you know I I like learning, but also like these are real things. And honestly, that even extends from so how I how I escaped the Chinese internment camp is like number one on that list because it same similar situation where it was like. This was on the periphery of my knowledge, but certainly I had never experienced like a personal narrative like this that that really opened my eyes. Um, but honestly, even like the James Charles one, that's a that's a celebrity story that I knew nothing about. Um, and I was like, this is fascinating. I knew absolutely nothing about this. Um, so I, I really enjoyed that. Let's let's go to the the more serious one first. Um, I escaped Chinese internment camp. It, it's definitely one of the most essential comics I've read this year. Um, it's about yeah. a woman from the yeah. Well, we're only young... we're only in February though, so I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> fair, fair. <laughs> <laughs> it's about this woman from uh, the Xinjiang Autonomous Region in China. She's a mother of three, uh, arrested and sent to an internment camp for um, Uyghur women, uh, effectively for being Muslim, right? Um, so how, how does this story come together? Like, uh, like how do you align on, on this topic um, when you're starting out working on this with, uh, you got Fumita Azim and, and Josh Adams, um, you know, on art and design? Um, well, first, I'll preface it by saying this was difficult because it was the most politically uh, dangerous comic we'd done. In fact, we had three different artists that had to back out at various points. I'll get to that in really. Time um now that's saying something you it know it's is, not like yeah. you've been apolitical <laughs> oh exactly yeah, yeah like they are yeah yeah anyways i'll get to that in a second uh i mean how this came about is uh again we had we had uh, received a lot of success with the stuff we had done um and so i went to insider back last uh june july i think it was july with a bunch of pitches and one of them was yeah you know because i'd read about and i'd heard about everything was happening to the uyghurs because uh, it's a genocide i mean yeah that's the thing then People don't. People aren't aware of this, but there are potentially over a million people that are that are being killed and put into concentration camps or re-education camps, as the Chinese government likes to call them. Um, and it's it's an atrocity. It's an atrocity, and not enough people are speaking or talking about this. Uh, and so yeah. I had heard about it. I'd read about it. I'd done some reading on it, and that was one of the stories I pitched. I said, "Look, I want to find a survivor, someone who's gone through it, someone who was able to get out uh, onto the other side, and he or she can tell their story." Uh, and so Insider immediately was like, "Yes, they give they gave me the green light. It's probably the fastest one i've had the green light on other than the capital riots one that josh and i did at the beginning of last year um but uh, yeah so we had the green light immediately then i reached out to a number of Uyghur organizations um who are trying to raise aware raise awareness of it and through one of them um they actually put me in contact with the zumrat uh, they said well here are a number of people you can talk to and i read through some of their stories and um they're all tragic they're all uh, horrible to read through uh in some rats there was something about zumrats i think just I think it was that because she had the, the children and, um, you know, she was the mother of three. Um, there's just something about that story that just spoke to me. I, and I wanted to tell her story. 
Um, and so from there, um, uh, we were able to sit down with her, not in person, but over Zoom. Uh, we had a couple of myself and Walt, uh, the aforementioned uh, data editor slash uh, resident geek at Insider. Uh, and so we sat down, we did a number of interviews. So I took, I took her story from some, um, a, a transcript or her uh, testimony that she, she did at a tribunal last year that was held in London and mixed it with uh, the actual interview that we did. And so this entire story is in her words. Um, and yeah. so it's everything that happened from who she was beforehand through to, um, everything that the Chinese government came in and all the restrictions they placed on them. And then through to her again, being in prison for being Muslim, um, they're trying to eradicate Islam in that country. Um, there's a whole there, and that's another one where there's a whole backstory. Like I said, I could tell an entire graphic novel story or a trilogy of graphic novel stories about what's happening there. Like why, how it started, mm -hmm. why the Chinese government is so paranoid about the region uh, and about the Uyghurs. Um, I mean, there's, yeah, it's, I can go on and on about that. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was, I remember after the first, because there's an hour and a half session, we sat down with her, with Zamrat and an interpreter, because um, she doesn't speak English. Um, and so at the end of it, like, Walt and I just had to like, I think for 10 minutes, we just sat there, we just sat there. And then we went for a walk outside in the fresh air, because we're like, this story is just so there's, it's so tragic, like everything that yeah. happened to her. Um, and yeah, and I mean, very quickly from there, um, I went off, I, like I said, I took all, I took the transcript, I took uh, the transcript of the interviews, as well as the uh, testimony she provided, and I kind of put together the story. Uh, and then getting back or get, go, getting to the artists, uh, we, Josh and I um, had decided that he wouldn't be the right person for this project, just because he's not Muslim, he's not female, he's not uh, uh, Asian. Um, and we, we realized we needed someone some of that kind of checked off some of those boxes um, because we felt that was the right thing to do for the story. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, there were three different artists that we spoke to. Um, and this is not, yeah, there were three different artists that we spoke to and they had to back up for various reasons. Uh, one of them lives in a country that is politically uh, in turmoil. And so she was afraid that if she was involved, that uh, it would get back to her uh, and her government would actually perhaps even imprison her because they're there are some ties between that country and China. There were some that had to back yep. it out for business reasons, and there were some that backed it out for personal reasons. Um, sure. And so finally we got to Famida. Um, and to be honest, I mean, we got to her through one of the people that had to back out. Um, and if I had known about Famida at the first place, I would have just brought her on board. Um, sure, right. And I mean, <laughs> I remember the first call I had with her. She's like, you know what? Um, F it. Like, I'm doing this. Like, I don't care. Um, and so, yeah, she did a phenomenal job. And she actually did 14 pages in the span of two and a half weeks. It was phenomenal. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. She, Cause it was, it was a tough timeline, tough deadline. We wanted to get out and, and at the end of December. Uh, and so, yeah, she knocked it out in two and a half weeks. It was incredible work. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a harrowing story and I'm so glad, like I said, it's probably one of, it's probably the, one of the stories that I'm most proud of, or proudest of. Um, and yeah, it's, it's an important story and I'm looking forward to telling more stories like that in the future. Yeah, awesome. No, it's so again, it's called I Escapes Chinese Interment Camp. Uh, people can find this again, it's just free on insider.com. I'll include links in the show notes for anybody who wants to check it out. You can do it right now. Again, like you can sit down and read this thing um, right now, and it's it, it reads very smoothly. Again, like it is a harrowing story. I mean, it is brutal. The details are tragic and, and deeply, deeply sad, but also it's one of those things where it's like, this is real and this is happening and this is actual testimony of what's going on. And, and that awareness, I think, is is essential. Um, so I, I've got a few questions. One thing I want to bounce off first, though, is, you know, you said, like, there's so much to tell here, right, with this whole situation. And there's so much detail. And obviously, this piece, the goals are not to do all that, right, to give the full background of it. Um, do you have plans for like a graphic novel kind of like follow up or, you know, obviously, you've got the the material. Do you think you'll do it? I've thought about it. I mean, I'm so busy right now with a number of other things that I haven't had a chance to sit down and put together a proposal. But um, uh, we are uh, we're in the midst of translating into five different five other different languages. The uh, Uyghur Human Rights Council um, that we've that's helped us out along the way. They're going to translate and they're going to help distribute it because they want to get it out to not just English people that speak English, but also like people in the general area like Malaysia oh, and nice. China. Um, cause again, their, their whole point is they want to raise awareness. That's what we're trying to do. Um, so, I mean, we've, I had talked to them originally, they said, you know, have you thought about a graphic novel? Uh, I just haven't had a chance to sit down and actually put to lay out exactly what it would be and put together the proposal. But I think, yeah. no, it's not, I, sorry, I don't mean, I think there is, there is enough there for a story. Um, I just need to figure out what the angle is going to be. If it's just going to be Zumra's story or an anthology of 
you know, a dozen other stories. Uh, because as I said, I mean, when I spoke to the WE organizations, they presented me a number of people that I could speak to. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a myriad of stories. Um, it's just, it's just finding that take, finding that angle and the hook, uh, and then going out and pitching it to different potential publishers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now that makes a lot of sense. So, so this story comes out right at the start of the year and, and now we're here at the tail end of, you know, the winter Olympics in, in Beijing, right. That continued to bring attention to this genocide, to, to a number of the human rights abuses, um, going on in China, but specifically here uh, with the Uyghurs, uh, what's the reaction to the story been like on your end? Um, obviously like attention has seemingly has escalated, at least in my yeah. view, right. You got like ESPN covering stuff, you know, cause athletes have ties there. It's like, it's getting a lot of attention. What's it been like for you? Well, the first thing is that uh, with the first week after it was published, there were, I received a number of phishing emails and text messages because before okay. this happened, I told, I, before this happened, I told my wife um, and I told a couple of friends, I'm like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to be allowed to travel to China now. Um, it's, uh, you know, at least in the, yeah. in the, at least in the near future. Uh, and I was like, you know, there's probably a good chance I might, I might get hacked too. So there were a number, I had received a lot of text messages and a lot of emails uh, that were phishing, that, that were phishing, uh, that were trying to get me to click on certain links. Uh, like, oh, this, you, congratulations, you won something from Home Depot. I'm like, I haven't been into Home Depot in months, so I don't think so. Uh, and from other organizations. So, uh, yeah, so I believe they tried to hack me. That was the first reaction. Uh, second reaction That's is wild. Yeah. when I sent it out to a lot of my friends uh, and family members, um, it was a sort of reaction that you had where, like, this is powerful and I didn't even know about this. Like, thank you so much for telling the story. Um, and so that kind of, mm. that to me, that to me is the essence of what I'm trying to do and what insiders try to do. I mean, yes, we're trying to get clicks and we want people to, uh, to read it. Yes. Uh, you know, that's why we'll put out stories about Brittany or James Charles or, you know, the, 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 the Royals or something. Um, but I mean, we really sure, want right. to like, and we want to make people, we want to enter, sorry, not only entertain, but also like, uh, inspire, inspire conversation, inspire research. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, uh, there were a couple of people that actually reached out to me. They're like, yeah, I'm not even watching the Olympics this year because of what you told me. Like uh, everything's happening in China. Like how can I, how can I support it? And even myself, I'm a huge Olympics fan. And this year, no, I'm kind of, I have, I, I kind of sitting out. Like I check every now and then to find how, how many medals Canada won. Yes, I still live in, I live in the U.S., but I still check up on Canada because uh, it's always my home. <laughs> sure. um, yeah. But yeah, I, I like, I've lost interest in the Olympics this year just because it's a huge propaganda thing for Beijing. Uh, and they're covering right. up, and they actually trolled. I can't believe that they trolled the world by having a, a Chinese um, uh, a, a Olympian that um, put that um, uh, finished off the torch run uh, in the opening ceremonies. And who has Uyghur roots? I'm like, they are troll, oh. they are trolling the entire world. Like, yes, you have complaints about this. We don't care. We're going to put it front and center. Here's someone who has bought into what China is. Yeah, that's pretty messed up. Yeah. Um, okay, so, <laughs> yeah. so I mean, the hacking thing's pretty wild too, though. I mean, that's like, that's real, right? Like, that's real immediate backlash. Um, was it? I don't know. Is there anything you you anticipated it? You kind of see it's coming. Um, was there a point where you were like worried about putting this out into the world? Where you're like, I don't know if I can do this. Um, or were you you're pretty convicted throughout the whole thing? I was convicted. I mean, the most difficult part was, like, as I said, the, when we were trying to find the artist, because it was a good month, month and a half to, you know, search. Uh, and, yeah. you know, all of a sudden we had an amazing artist uh, attached and then she couldn't do it. You know, then another amazing artist, she couldn't do it. Um, so I w there's maybe about a couple seconds, of like seconds where I was like, you know, is it is it worth it? Like, but that, like I said, that was just a very, very brief one or two seconds. I'm like, no, this, it actually reaffirmed that this story needs to be told uh, because people are afraid because for, because of business reasons or their own government might be helping out the Chinese government. No, like, no, this story, this story needs to be told. Uh, and my wife was fully behind me. Uh, and even, as I said, you know, I had one friend who texted me, he's like, wow, like, what are you doing, man? I'm like, no, dude, I'm sorry. Like this story needs to be told. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you've gone deep on this, on the situation. Obviously you've had these, these face to faces with, uh, Zumrat and, and her story and her testimony. Um, how, where would you point, you know, readers and listeners who have read this and want to, want to understand the situation better and like, and, and maybe even the secondary part of that of like anything that can be done, like what's important, like what in your view are like the, the things people can do, which not that like I'm looking for, you just solve it yeah. <laughs> here in the short term because it's a messy yeah. situation. Yeah. But what are your what are your thoughts there? It's a good question. Um, and I mean, when my wife asked me, why aren't we, why aren't we doing about this? It's such a politically fraught discussion uh, because sure. I mean, relations with China, uh, whether you're in Canada or the US or whatever country you're in, I mean, 
there's a lot of trade with China. Um, there's a, I mean, you kind of blacklist them and not deal with them, but that's just going to make things even worse to some extent. Um, so in terms of like practicality, what you can do, I encourage people to read up on it. I mean, there are other stories about survivors. Uh, the New Yorker had a great um, article back uh, early last year. I can't remember the name of the, um, uh, the woman. Uh, so I just read up on it. Uh, reach out to your local politician, whether it's a congressperson, a senator, uh, or a member of parliament in Canada or in the UK. Uh, just you know, make them aware of it. And then read up on ways of con contacting and maybe boycotting potentially like brands. Because, uh, for instance, like, uh, like uh, Nike. Nike, I believe, has some factories in the Xinjiang region. Um, I believe I might be wrong. If I'm wrong, then, you know, like, please you know, <laughs> don't shoot the messenger. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, like find out cause there are research on this, uh, there's research and there's stuff online you can find out. And if there, if that's the case, like if Nike or some of these other companies are uh, dealing with that region or, um, like kind of look, taking a blind eye to it, like reach out to them and let them know. I mean, whether it's just contacting someone in public relations or getting an email address or whatever. I mean, I think every email, uh, uh, counts, uh, and uh, there are a number of Uyghur organizations online, like the Uyghur Human Rights Council. Um, there's the tribunal that was that happened last year. Like, read up on this and reach out to them, and you know, ask them what what you can do, and they they can probably direct you to the proper person or or people uh, to reach out to. Sure, sure, okay, yeah, no, that all makes sense. Yeah, it, it is. It's definitely messy, but it is one of those things where it's like, well, there are small things, obviously, that each person can do to to try and. It, again, like you said, at a minimum, call awareness to the situation. Um, and, and obviously that's been growing, I, I think, in in some positive ways uh, because it is uh, pretty scary stuff. Pretty scary stuff. Definitely highly recommend it. And, and even spread the word on social media. I mean, even just, yeah, I mean, this is a plug for myself, but like uh, post post the post the, the, the comic that we did. Like post it on, on Twitter or on Instagram. Like just like make people aware of this. I mean, again, that's the best thing. We just need, we need people to talk about this and be aware of what's happening. Yeah, for sure. How, how much of this, so obviously like, there's a lot to the story. I mean, and, and one of the things that I think you do so effectively in, in this story is, you know, you're really condensing it into simple, um, not sound bites, but like, it's, it's simple. You can read this pretty quickly. You're not, you're letting Zumrat tell the story, but you're not getting in the way with, with exposition. Um, I mean, how, how hard was it to, to cut because you must have had just like loads of other anecdotes and things that that could fit in there. Oh yeah, uh, I mean, there, there, yeah, there, there are so many um, trials that the Chinese government had to put, have put the Uyghurs through. Um, yeah, there were a lot of there were a lot of things that we had to cut. I mean, they had to at one point the Chinese government decided that, okay, we want this piece of land, which was a, a cemetery. So they forced all the Uyghurs to go in and um, basically excavate and they have to uh, un, you know, like, um, yeah, excavate and unbury their, their dead uh, family members. Um, Jeez. Yeah. And then, they, yeah, I mean, it's just, and she, sh and she has pictures. That's the thing. She has pictures. Um, and so wow. that's, it was, like I said, after Walt and I had our discussion with her, our first interview with her, we had to sit down and just like, decompress because it's tough even i'm just getting work up now just thinking about some of the stuff she had to go through um and so yeah there were there's a there were a lot but i mean we wanted to keep it we didn't want to go off on a lot of tangents or um in storytelling you have to you have to know what to cut and you need to make sure the story is going at a proper pace um because you don't want the reader to kind of get bored or you don't want to feel like you're putting redundant information like there were so many times that, for instance there were so many times that she's beaten um, she was beaten mm -hmm. and tortured at so many points in the six months that she was um, uh, incarcerated and uh, and everything. And we, you know, I, you don't want to, you don't want to, it's not torture porn. You don't want to be like, okay, now she's beaten again. Now she's beaten again. Now she's beaten again. So you have to kind of just cut you. Yeah. It's got, it's got to have a flow to it. And so that's why at a certain point you want to cut away and, and show what her father, sorry, what her husband and her, and her, um, her children are doing. Uh, yeah. Because I mean, she was lucky. And I know there were some comments when it happened online. It's like, oh, well, you know, she got lucky because there's a lot of people that are still that did not get out after three months. Um, sure. And it's true. She was lucky because she was married to someone who was, uh, who was born from Pakistan. Uh, and he let the authorities know the Pakistani um, the consulate in uh, Beijing. Uh, and he was he was aware he was there to raise a rac uh, ruckus. And so that helped. That did help out. So she was not one of the lucky ones. And she was able to they were able to get to the U.S. because of it. Um, but yeah, to, I mean, I, I now I'm on a tangent. But yeah, there's just there's just a flow. You have to figure out like what the right uh, what the right parts are, what the you know like when to introduce them. 
because um, yeah, I mean, the story could have been three, four, five times as long. But again, right. we just want to get get the major the major um, parts of the story out, the major elements, the major story beats, and then finish it, and then be able to go off and do more do more research on it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. What's um what's coming next for you from from Insider? What kind of things are you working on that you can talk about? I can't really talk about much. Um, the, um I will hint that there's one about Putin. That's all I can say. I've been okay. speaking to. Topical. Uh, uh, it's, <laughs> I would say so. It's now, it's Sunday, <laughs> what, the 20th at 1145 Eastern Standard Time, 1045 your time. Uh, and I mean, who knows? Maybe there's an invasion of Ukraine right now. Um, so I've been speaking to, now I don't know if this, I don't know if we will do the story, but I have been speaking to a lot of people who have been personally attacked by, uh, by Putin. Um, mm. Someone who's been poisoned twice by him. Um, someone yeah. whose uh, lawyer was killed um by putin um and yeah so i've been speaking to a lot of people about that that again uh that could be uh that could be a difficult one for me to put because i mean i'm sure the russian hackers would come after me uh again we may not end up doing this story because there's another there's two or three others right now that uh uh could be could be laid down next um but yeah there we we have some really really interesting stories that uh, are being discussed right now at insider Wild, wild. All right. So that that definitely sounds like it'll be interesting. So I mean, one thing I I was going to ask you about this, you know, even with just the Zumrad interview and stuff, but like, yeah, it sounds like you're doing a lot of the research and the interviewing. Like you're doing, I don't know, I feel like it's a thing that like almost gets overlooked and like, oh, you're doing these like short, simple comics. It's like, no, you're like doing all this journalism and research and stuff. Like how, is that a part of your background? Is that is that something that you kind of anticipated you'd be doing? Like where did that? No, that this part? I no I ha, I do not have any journalism background. I wrote a couple articles back in uh, university uh, for my like for the local college or like the university newspaper. Sure, um, yeah. But other than that, no. I mean, I haven't. I, everything's been fiction for me. Uh, whether it's yeah. you know uh, working on fiction films or working in the music industry or comics or podcasts, like everything's fiction. So it's only in the last year and a half, two years now that I've actually done some nonfiction stuff with the insider pieces, and then I've done a bunch of uh, podcasts with Wondery. Um, but yeah, it's um, yeah, I have no background. Yeah, you know, I have very little background on it. But I'm a storyteller, and I mean, what really impressed me with Insider was the very first meeting I sat down with Walt. Josh and I sat down with Walt, and as I mentioned, Nick Carlson, uh, the global editor in chief, who comics geek um and but he understands story and i mean right from the get-go he's like look who's the like who's the main character like well, who's this about what are the obstacles and what does he or she or they do to, to overcome it i mean that's what it is that's when it, in journalism um and that's like in terms of fiction storytelling that's what that's what good storytelling boils down to uh and so i, I that's something from all the comics i've done in podcasts and everything uh, I understand that. And so, yeah, there, but there is a lot of research. I mean, whether it's a six page, um, uh, recap of the Capitol riots, which we did in like well, a week and a half. And, we, uh, the riots were January 6th. And I think we came out with a comic book version of it on January 20th, I believe, uh, yeah. or the 25th. Um, so it means we, a quick turnaround or whether it's something like Zumrat story or impeachment, uh, where you do spend, I spend a lot of time. I mean, it's a lot of research. It's a lot of research. Sure. Um, and as you know, there's a lot of like fake news or fake, fake stories that are out there too. So you kind of have to call and make sure and do the research and double check. And the great thing about insiders, we have copy editors, but we also have uh, proofreaders to make sure like sure. everything has to be sourced. Everything needs to be, we can't just make up stuff. Um, and that's, that's something I learned actually in impeachment. The first one we did, uh, where I actually created, um, I created like fake conversations with Nancy Pelosi and some aides. Like they're like, oh, what should we do? What should we do? Like that sort of stuff. And they, and uh, we actually, those were some of the pages that we'd scripted. And they said, no, we got to cut that because although we loved the idea at the beginning, we haven't been able to back it up that these kind of conversations were held. Um, and so everything is held to a very, very, very high standard at Insider. I think it's probably a smart call when you're dealing with you know situations that are so fraught and yeah. so political, right? Yeah. To just because narratively, I totally get why you'd want to do that, right? You just it's just kind of a beat. It's something they yeah. might have said. You know, it's you're fictionalizing yeah. it, but it's like just don't even just don't even mess with that. Just put it all yeah stuff, so, that's happened, stuff that happened exactly you know? so i mean zumrat story i mean it was her it was it was it was the first person narrative and so we're going to do a lot more of those moving forward just because of how powerful internment camp was um but even like yeah. the michigan the attempted kidnapping of the michigan governor uh, i mean that was well, we took the fbi affidavit and that was the spine so i take that as the spine and then i add some other pieces from this from this media source or this media source but that's the spine like this is this is what this is who we follow this is what they did on these particular dates like this is when they were colluding this is when they sat down to do the like um, the um, shooting practice at the gun range, or this is what they the this you know in the basement. This is when they talked about this and they joked about the bombs and they did a um, they hopped in the cars and they actually they went to her cottage 
uh, in kind of like her lake house and kind of like, who should we do tonight? Like, hell yeah. Like there's actually quotes from the FBI affidavit. Uh, Cause again, it's a new source and we can't, it's not fiction. Like everything needs to be done and needs to be done properly and everything needs to be backed up and proven like this actually happened. Yeah. Yeah. No, and it's effective that way. All right, good. So again, we'll link to this in the show notes. Definitely recommend people to read this um, and the rest of the work. Cause again, like you're, you're covering a variety of things here, the stuff in the entertainment sphere, you know, with Britney Spears and, and stuff like that, that are obviously just like topical stories as well. So it's not all, um, necessarily as, as, uh, serious, you know, speaking of not as serious, right. You're, you're also obviously you're storing fiction, right. That's your, that's your background. Um, you know, you're, you're written stuff like kill Shakespeare, like I mentioned, um, I really enjoyed Luke Cage, every man, which Thank is, you. a if people haven't read it, it's a, a Marvel comics book where you, um, basically look at, uh, Luke Cage suffering from CTE. Um, which obviously is like, I'm not like, oh, that's more fun, but it's actually a really interesting concept <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> because it's like, yeah, that like that makes sense for Luke. Um, this, you know, it's unbreakable skin, but what if he's got this brain disease going on? Yeah. Um, because these amazing Declan Shalvey covers, uh, I definitely recommend people checking that out. Um, what, what was the experience like writing a, writing a Luke Cage book and, and bringing CTE into the equation? What was, what was that for you? Uh, well, first of all, I mean, the opportunity to work with Marvel was just, it was a dream come true for me. Um, I mean, I will profess that I've never, like, I'm sure you could run circles around me and my comic knowledge. You've probably read uh, three times, four times, ten times the amount of comics that I've that I've read in my lifetime. But um, I mean, I put I put Marvel and I put DC on pedestals. I put Image on. I mean, I put a lot of these places on pedestals, to be honest. So every time I work with a new publisher, I'm like, I can't believe I work with Image. I can't believe I work with Marvel. I can't believe I'm working with DC, like that sort of thing. Um, but no, I mean, yeah. So I mean, first of all, to work with Marvel is phenomenal. I had some amazing editors. Jake Thomas was the first one that brought me on board. He had been a fan of the Nancy Drew Hardy Boy stuff I had done with Dynamite. Uh, he asked me to pitch a story, uh, like a Luke Cage story, uh, and he gave me, I think, all of like 36 hours to do it or 48 hours. I'm like, oh, great. Thanks. Thanks for the heads up. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I was just, I had read, again, it was sort of the thing where as a creator, I'm always reading. I'm always reading, not doing specific research, but just like, oh, this is kind of interesting. Like I'd read a bunch, a number of things on CTE. Uh, and so I, you know, I was like, Luke Cage, what can I do? He's unbreakable uh like physically so wh what is the best opponent uh like who's wh who's his real nemesis uh and so i was like well what if it was himself and then yeah i think i think it was in the shower actually i sometimes do my best thinking in the shower um, sure, yeah. and so because it gets me away from my phone and the laptop and everything uh and so it's like oh cte i'm like oh wow i wonder if anyone's done tackled that in comic books like in superheroes uh in the hat and so i was like okay well that's the story so i pitched as yeah you know like um a do the right thing type of thing where you've got this middle this, this heat wave you've got these tensions you know as someone who had who's only lived in the states now i've lived in the states for uh eight years almost eight years uh but i mean the healthcare system i'm like i've had to experience it both the highs and the lows here i was like okay there'll be you know it's just all these different things that came together and it was a quick little pitch and uh jay called me up a, a day or two later he's like all right yep yeah, you're in like let's do this um, so it was amazing to work with it, uh, to work with him, to work with Mark Basso, to work with uh, Alana Smith, um, just amazing, amazing, uh, editors. Um, and yeah, it was, it was really cool. They gave me, they gave me a lot of freedom. They all, you know, but there's also restraints and as a creator, I enjoy working with restraints because if there's no restraints, if there's no training wheels, I can kind of go, I kind of get, um, there's a bit of atrophy or there's sort of, I get stuck. I'm like, oh my God, there's so many possibilities, but if there's certain, hmm guide you know like guardrails i mean that helps me out yeah. uh and they were great i mean jake especially from the beginning i want to uh, and mark to some extent too uh but jake was really great in terms of like helping me figure out i had all these ideas he was able to help me like flesh out like okay or help me focus on it um and then i mean and then alana coming on board for the last like four issues which uh, she was it was it was like they, they passed the torch or passed baton and like she knew it's sort of like they had a mind meld and they knew exactly what to do from an editorial mm. perspective but uh it was great uh Genoi, um lindsay the artist was phenomenal uh we got ian um herring who i'd worked with on kill shakespeare do the colors it was all canadian so yeah. myself ian and Genoi are all canadian uh, we're nice. on a great American uh, superhero. Uh, but no, it was, yeah. it was great. And I mean, CTE, I did a lot of research. I spoke to a couple of specialists. Um, and yeah, it was really, really interesting to tell the story because um, when I'm at comic conventions, people ask me, so like, what's, what's, what's the story that, that you, that you uh, what, what's your favorite story that you've written? Uh, and I was like, well, you can't pick your favorite children. Uh, and there's different elements. So like Kill Shakespeare was my first, one, first comic that I co-wrote. So I'm like, okay, so I, that's a special place in my heart. Um, Son of Hitler, I think, has the great, has the best 
plot twist uh, or best third act of a story. So I, you know, I can speak to that. But Luke Cage to me was the most, I think it was the most emotional scenes I'd written. And I wasn't a father at the time, but the most emotional scenes with him and his daughter. Um, because here he is, he's battling this serial killer in the middle of a heat wave in, Har- in Harlem. Uh, people are dying and he's he'd been diagnosed with CTE. So he has to real, and he's looking after his daughter. Um, and he's just looking at her and he's, um, at one point, like he breaks down completely, uh, because he's, he's thinking about like, I have all these things I've, I've, uh, I've, uh, the borough to save. Um, I have this serial killer to stop, but also like, who am I going to be a, in a year? You know, who am I going to be in five years or 10 years? Am I going to, am I going to be able to even like operate as a human being, as a father, as right. a superhero? Um, and those were just really, really emotional scenes. Um, and so that's, you know, that when I think back on Luke Cage, that's, that's, the, those are the parts that I, that I really appreciate the most or that I'm the most proud of. Yeah. Yeah. There are moments in that where he's like, he's like, he like forgets her name yeah kind of yeah. thing. Like he forgets his daughter's name yeah. and it's like, that hits, yeah. that hits hard. Yeah. Um, you know, I've got three little ones and it's like, oh, there you go. yeah. Yeah, you know, and it's like, oh, that's that's rough stuff. Um, so yeah, no, it's it's well told and definitely worth checking out. Um, if people haven't read that one before, uh, you mentioned you know you've done some some Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew stuff. Obviously, the the big one with that is there was a lot of controversy, I guess, a couple years back now when the death of Nancy Drew was announced. Um, I, I so I gotta tell you, the second I saw that happening, like I you know I'm in the comic scene, I saw this stuff yes. happening on Twitter, um, and I was like. Well, I bet the first issue, I bet I know what the reveal is. <laughs> it's just like, like knowing how story works, like knowing, yeah. like just how mystery and kind of the noir of a Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew is probably going to work. Um, I kind of have a feeling I know how this is going to end. Everybody's, everybody's, you know, maybe jumping the gun a little bit. Uh, what was that experience like? I mean, it, that must have been weird to become like the social media villain. Uh, <laughs> how did you, how did you handle that? <laughs> social media villain. Uh <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was a very wild, uh, 24 hours, to be honest. Uh, I think that was in, I'm trying to remember the date. I think it was like January 30th or February 1st, maybe February 3rd or something, uh, 2020. Um, so that was, uh, so <laughs> let me frame it. So this is before something called coronavirus really became, uh, in the zeitgeist and became a thing. Um, we'd heard about some little flu in China at the time. Um, but no, that was, that was weird because, um, dynamite put out the press release. Uh, it was the 90th anniversary of, uh, the first publication of an Nancy Drew story. Um, and so dynamite position as, okay, you know, the death of Nancy Drew to, to commemorate. And I think it was just a combination of like to celebrate and maybe even the term celebrate was in the press release. Um, and I'm not going to throw anyone under the bus. I mean, I might've actually been the person that said, Hey, like, let's make sure we put something to like the 90th anniversary and commemorate and this is the weirdest story that's ever been told. Um, so I think it was the fact yeah. that it was 90th anniversary. We kill Nancy Drew and it's two white guys that are doing it. Yeah. That was myself and Joe Eisma. Yeah. Uh, so I think it was the combination of those three things. And some people are like, what the beep? Um, and yeah. so I yep. think that really got people, um, aggravated. It was just like a handful of people, but then they're loud and they got into onto Twitter and social media and that from there it just ballooned. So, I mean, within a couple hours, I got phone calls from CNN, from New York times, wow. uh, from another yeah. location. Like, yeah, we'd like to talk to you about this. That's what's, what's happening. It was trending on social media. I'm like, Oh my God. Um, and yeah, I mean, even a lot of the people I spoke, all the, actually all the people I spoke to that day, all the interviewers um, and all the media, they all said, they're like, look, we know what's really happening here. Uh-huh. Um, but like this is we we need to talk about this controversy. They were talking about the more of the controversy than the actual content. But every single sure, interview right. they I, they said they're like, let me guess, is this what happens? I'm like, I can neither confirm nor nor deny. Wink, wink. Um, yeah, right. Because yeah, I mean, you don't want to you don't want to ruin your story. You don't but ruin it's it, like, yeah. But I mean, yeah. As you know, I mean, for super you know, Superman's been killed. Like everybody, Archie's been killed. Like everybody's been killed in comics. So this is comics. Exactly, yeah. it's comics. I mean, people come back, or there's different twists on it. And I mean, also, I leaned into. I said, look, I mean, it's going to be refer. I'm going to reference uh, Laura. I'm going to reference like a bunch of other classic noir stories. Uh, and sure. if you read between the lines, like, okay, so this is what actually happens in the death of Nancy Drew. Um, and so, yeah, I was. Did you see it? Did you see it coming at all? Because the op- optics yeah. wise, when you when you no, you didn't see it. No, I did. I was yeah. hoping that it would generate some some. I was just hoping the title, the, the death of Nancy Drew, would generate like, oh wow, they're killing off Nancy Drew, and maybe we would get some some relatively high profile hits. I didn't think the New York Times would cover it. I didn't think that CNN mm-hmm. would cover it. 
Uh, I didn't think yeah. that all these other like Newsweek or Time or all these other spots would 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 cover it. Um, yeah, I mean, like it, it it was everywhere. It was everywhere, not only in the U.S. and Canada, but even overseas. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I didn't. For, I mean, I hoped for it. Uh, and to be honest, like it, it was terrifying. Well, it wasn't terrifying. I was partly scared. At some point, I'm like, oh my god, especially because uh, the the one thing I didn't foresee was okay. You're right. Like it's two white guys that are doing this. Um, I'm like, oh god, like you're right. You're totally right. Um, but on the flip side, from a marketing perspective, I was like, okay, this is great. Like, let's like, let's get this out there. Like, let's like, uh, you know, the first issue was ready. I'm like, let's get out to comic shops now. Like in terms of PDFs, like let's have people read this, um, to keep, to keep the buzz going. And then, uh, it was slated for release in, I think, uh, April 1st or ironically enough, uh, or like the first week in April and lo and behold, you know, coronavirus hits and that shuts everything down. So the first issue of the death of Nancy Drew actually did not come out until, I don't even know, August or September of that year. And the trade yeah. still has not been released. The trade is now scheduled for release. Yes, I say scheduled. I don't know if that's a Canadian thing. No, I think that's just me <laughs> sound, trying to sound pretentious, maybe. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I had a high school teacher, George Cribbs, who was British. Uh, and so I just like the way it sounded. Anyways, I think it's scheduled for sure, release sure. next month uh, in March of twenty in March of this year. Okay. So yeah, I noticed that when I was, when I was prepping for it this. It still hasn't yeah. been released. So the individual issues have been released, uh, but not the trade. Um, and so that's... There have been printing problems and there are supply problems and uh, problems with the design team at, at Dynamite. That's an entire podcast I can talk to you about. Uh, but yeah, it's it's late for release. But yeah, it was it was a wild moment and no point in my life have I ever trended. And that was about a month or so after the impeachment comic with Insider came out. So within uh, within a few weeks, there were two of my two of the stories that I created that had gone viral on social media. Um, what was what was a bigger like people in your inbox, people in your mentions event, like, like any of the Trump comics or Nancy Drew? I'd say Nancy Drew just because it was a lot of it was, uh, was attacking me as a creator impeachment, uh, impeachment. A lot of people just would retweet it and post it on Instagram or other social media channels, but I'm not, you know, I'm not tagged to it. Um, just because, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not, it's, I'm not the be on the end all. They're not, they're not celebrating me. They're celebrating what Insider did and celebrating what this comic, what the comic does. With um, Hardy Boys, I was not. Yeah, I was. I was in some sense you could say I was personally attacked, um, just because like, oh God, how dare he do this? How dare he and his team put this together? Um, and Dynamite put this together. So, uh, in terms of like personal ones, me. In terms of like overall readership or in terms of overall like social media trending, I think the impeachment one was a little got more a little more traction. I was going to, yeah, I was, I was going to ask you like, you know, so did, you know, the, the, the all good presses or all press is good press kind of thing. Did that actually fan out in this instance? But then I guess because of the pandemic, like we have zero answer because it got so messed up with, with shipping schedules and releases and all that. Um, because I do feel like that in comics marketing, a lot of times that's an issue as well, where it's like, we get the announcement yeah. and then that's for orders, yeah. but then the book doesn't come out for three months. So by the time yeah. it comes out, it's like, you know, and, and obviously that's gotta be kind of maddening in a situation like this for you, especially where it's like, people are so mad about something the optics yeah. of what the title is. And yeah. then you're like, well, if you just would read the first issue, but obviously that's not what the reaction is based yeah. on. Right. Um, and it's going to be a while before they can do that. So, so that's tricky. In, in retrospect, would you, would you do it differently? Would you try to like make sure dynamite marketed it differently? That sort of thing. Um, knowing what it, what it looked like. There's not much of a change they could have done. I mean, I'm, I'm actually glad that controversy happened because it got people talking about the store, about the comic. Uh, I just wish that we'd been able to release it in like six weeks later, as we originally hoped, or like, you know, two, two months later. But yeah, that is one of the difficult things about marketing through your traditional channels, like a traditional comic book. If you were to do something with a webtoon or what the great thing about Insider is, um, like it's out there. Like we uh, sometimes we'll send a preview out uh, like 24 or 48 hours in advance to make people aware of what's happening. Uh, for instance, like James Charles, we reached out to a bunch of uh, people in the beauty YouTuber like community just to say like, hey, here's a one minute teaser. Uh, here's a couple pages. Like this is going to be coming out uh, on Tuesday. Uh, look out for it. And so a lot of people are excited by it. Uh, I mean, that's the cool thing about doing something on Webtoon, like digital comics or something with Insider. Like you don't have that leg. Um, and so, yeah, it's, that's why it's it's so so tough to market you know, a comic, especially if you've got some sort of big bombshell uh, or some sort of big thing. Like, you need people, you need the comic buyer, the comic shops to buy it, and then you need the consumers to buy it. So you have to kind of space that, and then you need people to buy the trade too. So like, you know, six right. months later or twelve months later, so you got to figure out like, what do we tell at this point? How what do we tell at that point? What do we tell at that point? Um, and so yeah, it's it's one of the challenges, and I've always had that from the days of Peel Shakespeare through to 
death of Nancy Drew. Uh, yes, there's a lot of death and killing uh, in my titles, apparently. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, that's 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 always always a challenge you have as as someone marketing as a creator. And I I like to say that or I like to think. And a lot of people will back me up in, on this, especially Alan Payne from Dynamite. Like I do more uh, marketing my comics than most creators do. Uh, but yeah, you're always thinking like, what's the angle? What's the hook uh, for the release of issue one, issue two, issue three, the trade. And then of course, when it's solicited in, in previews. For sure. Yeah. Well, and it's just like, there's so many comics. Like there are so many comics that are released every week. I mean, the, the challenges to standing out. Yeah. I have to think have never been stronger. I mean, it's like there is there's just so much material every single week. So I, I hear it on that front for sure. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's so many comics, but not only like you print comics, but you're also competing against comicsology. You're competing against webtoon. Like webtoon, I don't think people realize like how many people oh, yeah. buy comics, like your traditional flop floppies, versus how many people read webtoon or tapas on a weekly or daily basis. It's oh yeah, it's it's night and day. Like. 10 times, 100 times more people read Webtoon than will read your traditional comic book. Like, it's it's mm-hmm. crazy. And I don't, I just think a lot of people aren't aware of this. And that's why I get excited. Like, I mean, yes, technically, sub, like, there's Substack stuff. And yes, I'm glad that they're in. Uh, in Zest World, uh, started by Chris G, formerly at Gimlet. I've helped them out on a couple things in the past. Like, that's going to be launching in, I think, this spring. Uh, I mean, you've got a, di- a bunch of different mediums. And so that's what really excites me about um it's new ways of getting your comic and getting your story into into the inboxes or getting into the hands or into the eyeballs of readers these days like people like comics so you don't need to worry about like going through your traditional comic stores Uh, i mean there's just if there's a story to be told there's different mediums now and that's what's super exciting about the industry right now yeah for sure no i I like it's like i love having a local comic shop and that experience but i also recognize that's a super specific niche experience yeah. you know that like oh, yeah. that is not yeah. the easiest thing to waltz into whereas downloading webtoon and having your phone and having a gazillion comics you can scroll through is super easy and millions of people do it are, are the insider stuff are, is the insider stuff on webtoon or top us yet uh not yet uh just very briefly i mean the, and don't get me wrong when i say i'm excited about like comicsology or substack or all this other stuff uh, I mean, there's still nothing like the traditional, like going to your local shop. In fact, and as a father of three, you'll appreciate this. Yesterday, I brought my two, my almost three year old, I brought my almost three year old to the comic shop for the first time. Uh, it, oh, it was a fun. magical yeah. experience to be able to share that with him. So uh, he picked out a nice Mickey Mouse graphic novel and IDW republishing. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was great. It was, it was a great experience. Awesome. Anyway. <laughs> That's not here near there. Um, yeah, Insider is not on Webtoon right now or Tapas. We're looking at, uh, we're talking, we're in, we're in conversations with with uh, various other di- uh, distributors at the moment. That's all I can say. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. I, those would those would fit there. I think pretty pretty seamlessly or in that style, uh, for sure. All right, cool. So, um, I, I, final piece. Uh, what's your favorite Assassin's Creed game? Because you're, <laughs> you're you're deep in the Assassin's Creed verse. Um, I'm uh, I'm an Ezio guy. So like two, three, I think three is my favorite still. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm just, it's funny because when they, when they first approached, when uh, Titan first approached Connor and I, uh, my uh, Connor McCreary, my Killshake 3 co-creator uh, and co-writer, um, they said, yeah, we've got this video game license. Um, we'd like you to pitch on it. Uh, we can't tell you what it is until you sign an NDA. So as we were signing the NDA, I was like, please let it be Assassin's Creed. Please let it be Assassin's Creed. You don't Assassin's even know Creed. what it is. Oh, that's fine. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then you sign the NDA and then they're like, oh, it's Assassin's Creed. They're like, can you come up with some pictures? We're like, yes, perfect. You know, I was like, yes, that's exactly what I hoped. Um, nice. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a traditional guy. I mean, the ones, the the Viking one, Valhalla was great. Um, I mean, Origins. Uh, I mean, I do like I do like Origins, to be honest. Uh, I mean, Origins is kind of maybe close number two. Um, but... Um, yeah, I don't know. There's just something about Etsu. I think it's because I just I love Florence. I love I love Tuscany. Uh, so I'm like, uh, and because Florence, Florence during the Renaissance at that period is the, probably the one of the most fascinating locales in history. I mean, everything that was going on with uh, Da Vinci, the Renaissance, um, uh, the, uh, the Medici's, like everything. I mean, that was the cult. That was that's where everything was happening in the world, whether it's from a cultural perspective, from a monetary perspective. Uh, from a military perspective, I mean, it's just, I think that's, I think that's re- what really draws me to that. And that's what really drew me to uh, Assassin's Creed overall um, is just, it's, it's historical fiction. Like you get to walk through Renaissance Italy, you get to walk through um, uh, French Revolution, like, uh, like Revolutionary Paris. Like it, it's, right. it's, the, it's the ultimate, as someone who enjoyed history class in high school, like it's, it's the ultimate game because you get to like experience and like interact with these things. Uh, right come, right come to yeah. life. so yeah that's to it's a long-winded answer of saying i'm a, i'm a i'm i'm a traditionalist i'm i'm old school i say i'm well i'm old school ac 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm on board with you there, but primarily because I haven't caught up. I'm, I'm perpetually yeah. behind. I've got Valhalla downloaded now, but I need I need to I it's, need to cover. It's so tough. There's, I mean, you you just talked about there's so many comics to read these days. There's so much oh to gosh, consume yeah. in entertainment, and that's from yes. the very beginning. And this is one I was just having a conversation the, a couple of days ago with someone who um, like an indie comics creator. He has a comic he wants to put out. He was asking me for some advice, and I did a talk uh, a week before that to um, a class at Ryerson uh, University up in Toronto. Um, and so I was like, look, you have to understand the comic that you're creating. You're not just competing against other comics uh, in the comic shop. You're competing against digital comics, but you're also competing against Netflix. You're competing against video games. You're competing against like anything. Right. Like we have some limited times. You're a father of three. Like I can't believe you have so much time to, I, I can't believe you even have time for the podcast, uh, let alone everything else you do. <laughs> um, but you're competing yeah. against everything. We have so little time. So what's going to make yours unique enough and exciting enough so that someone's going to sit down and read it for five minutes, 10 minutes, 25 right. minutes, an hour versus playing a game versus playing versus reading something else or versus watching the latest thing on Netflix. Yeah, no, it's, it's this incredible luxurious problem to have, you it's know, true. It's true, we yeah. have so much entertainment it's available true, yeah. all the time. Um, but yeah, shouts to my incredible wife for, for exactly, carving out yes. time for a podcast. Also, BTW. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, <laughs> she carved out time to let me sit here by myself at home to do this interview. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, all right, cool. So, so let, let, final question then with the Assassin's Creed stuff. So you've you've written comics, you've written uh, podcasts as well, including um, one that was on Audible, audio drama starring Riz Ahmed. What would? I, I, how much? I guess obviously you you are doing a lot of this, you know, with the the podcast and stuff. Um, how is like the comics narrative experience versus writing these these audio dramas? Um, and, and what are you kind of getting out of the the different type of you know storytelling? Um, I mean, they're both they're both again all storytelling comes down to who's the main character or who who's the subject? What do they want? What's the obstacle? How what do they do to overcome? I mean, like I said, that's what that's what it all boils down to. Um, so in some sense, it's the same thing. Um, I always, I try to, I'm very mathematical, I guess, or I'm very like structure. I'm a very structured writer um, in terms of like, if it's comic, say the death of Nancy Drew, I have six issues. You know, okay. So it's like, what happens in issue one, two, three, four, five, six. I kind of like overall, what's the story? What are the main points? Like the main story beats and then, okay, break it down. I got six episodes, six issues. Let's break it down into that. You know, and then what happens? What's the climax? What's the cliffhanger in each one? Uh, if I'm doing something like uh, Assassin's Creed uh, Gold for Audible, I've got eight episodes. Okay. I've, what's the overall story? What, what's going to happen in episode one? You know, it's the same sort of structure. Um, and then from there, like, okay, now I know what happens in, in episode one or issue number one. Uh, what's the cliffhanger going to be? What am I working towards? What's, what are the major, what's the major, like what's the climax of the story? Like that sort of thing. Um, so from that perspective, it's, it's the same. And then it becomes completely different in terms of like comic is visual. So, I mean, like what's, what's a visual, what's a very interesting location to set this at? Is it, uh, I could set it in an old factory, uh, like an abandoned factory because there's some cool stuff. There's, you know, uh, you can have some cool lighting, some cool effects going on, like silhouettes. They're running through this factory um, they're running, you know, like the, this could be a potential weapon. This could be, uh, this, the spot where they confront each other, they attack, uh, what's it going to look like in terms of like one person hits the other one person's on the ground, one person's hovering about to whack them with a pipe, whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, versus, um, uh, in audio, like what's, what's from an audio perspective, what's the most interesting location? Like if it's an abandoned factory, that's cool. But is that enough? Like, what's the, is there wind coming through? Is there like a creaky, like speaker system, like an old dilapidated speaker system? Like that's, I'm, sounds like I'm describing Bioshock, uh, but like, is there like an old, <laughs> like an old school, like sound that's coming out there? Is it windy? Um, maybe that's not, is there like, is an old mill? Like, I mean, in Assassin's Creed, I, in Assassin's Creed Gold, I created like a, a scene at an old uh, mill. So you've got like the water going. You know, unless you've got like mm. uh, like um, the big, you know, everything moving, all the gadgets are moving. So you have all this cool background noise. Then they go underwater. So like that's a cool sound effect of like they're above water and then all of a sudden splash, like, right. like that kind of thing. Um, so it's all about like once you know what the story is and the main character, uh, the character beats are and the plot beats, it's like, okay, what are the most interesting locations to set this stuff in? Um, and that's kind of like the, you know, to me, that's that's the major difference is the setting, the setting of these different locations. That's interesting. Oh, that's cool. Well, all right. So what else do you have coming up that you can talk about? Um, what, what do you have people coming that people should check out? Uh, well, we already talked about the death of Nancy Drew is slated for release. Uh, hopefully it's, I've been told it's now the end of March. Uh, originally okay. it was slated for 
originally would have been in late 2020, then it was going to be March of 2021, uh, and now it's going to be March of 2022. Um, I should get an update from Dynamite in the next week or so. So the death and edge shipping was, shipping problems are real. Holy cow! That a year a later, yeah. a year later, there's some there were some internal problems at Dynamite in terms of design. They got backlogged because of everything with the coronavirus. Um, sure, but yeah. I mean, yeah. So now it's that that that's the next coming out next thing coming out in comics. Uh, in terms of um, uh, Insider, as I said, we're gonna have we're gonna have another six to twelve stories that will come out this year. Uh, Josh will do the art on some. We'll have some, some other guest artists coming in. Uh, I can't really talk about them. I kind of hinted at one on Putin. We'll see if that one comes to light. Hopefully, it would be great because there's so many interesting stories. And he is the supervillain. He's the Lex Luthor these days. Well, I don't know if he's that smart. Oh, yeah. um, but I mean, like he's the he's the great he's the big bad in the world right now. Um, so yeah. yeah, it's some it's a story I'd love to tell. So look for that in the next uh, say two months or so. Uh, there'll be some other stories coming out uh, Insider from uh, in April or May uh, that I can't really talk about. And then in the audio world, um, we just finished my most recent. I did against the odds. Um, uh, a, what what did they call it? It was basically about the USS uh, Indianapolis, uh, which is there's um, Jaws is inspired by it. Uh, in the uh, final days in July of 1945, the final days of World War II, um, the U.S. Indianapolis had t- uh, just shy of 1,200 people on board. Uh, they were hit by a, a torpedo from a Japanese submarine. Uh, within 12 minutes, the entire ship went down. Uh, there were 900 survivors in the water, and they stayed in the water for three days, um, getting attacked by sharks. Uh, getting attacked by madness um, and the, the conditions. And so by then, I mean, only 300 people survived. It's the greatest uh, naval disaster, the, na- the greatest sea disaster in U.S. Navy history outside of um, um, uh, Pearl, Pearl Harbor. Um, it's just a fascinating story. So that was a four episode tale that I wrote uh, with uh, Wondery. Uh, and it just was released. I think the last episode was just released last week. Um, so if you want to hop on, go to go go to wherever you listen to your podcast. After you've listened to this one, of course, and listened to the rest of uh, all of Dave's <laughs> stories, uh, but you can check that one out. Uh, and then upcoming, I've got a couple. I'm closing a couple of deals actually in the fiction audio space. Um, I can't announce anything yet. Uh, one of them is comics based, an adaptation of a comic, um, and there's some sure. original IP that I've created. So some original stories. So uh, it's going to be busy. The next few months are going to be very very busy for me in the audio space and comic space. Well, that's good. That's good. Absolutely. All right, Anthony, uh, it's been a pleasure having you. I really appreciate you coming on. Again, we'll include links to the show notes to all the work here, uh, in- including all the insider comics that we talked about. Uh, and definitely recommend people go check those out. Uh, I'm Dave. You can, of course, find my stuff at comicbookherald.com, at comicbookherald, pretty much anywhere on social. And, uh, you know, like, subscribe, keep listening to all this stuff for more creator interviews just like this one. So, Anthony, thanks so much for joining. No, thanks for having me. This has been a blast.